congregation. From this day forth, we will not stop praying for you. We will continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing good fruit, good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the sons he loved in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. This scripture is taken from Colossians 1, 9 through 14. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and all of us that do as he has commanded. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I have just one thing I want to share before I bring up Evangelist Cindy to minister the word. Uh, turn your Bibles to Psalms 1. This is a passage of scripture that's on my heart because, you know, the last couple of days, it seems like not only myself but other people I was talking to were under, you know, attack, you know, emotionally in their mood. And it was really, it was really unique when I was sharing this with a person. They told me, they said, you know what? Myself, other people have been dealing the same thing. And you have to understand that when you see multiple people, Christians, that are going through the same thing, it is a demonic attack. Yes, next month, all next month, that's what I'm dealing with. Demons, dominion and deliverance okay the entire month if you don't believe in demons this won't be the place for you to be uh, if you don't believe in deliverance this won't be the place for you to be all right but I have come to understand from looking at a scripture where Jesus was in the synagogue and he had to cast a demon out of a person that was sitting in what we would consider the church there are things that have plagued us followed us generationally okay from our past that have attached itself to us that we need to cut those ties and walk free okay you will never be able to walk free unless you're educated on what freedom is you see a slave didn't understand what freedom was until they experienced freedom okay so we have to start looking at this as the Bible teaches. Now, there are some people that feel that demons aren't real. Well, I heard it different because Jesus taught about demons. So he evidently thought they was real. We see that he had a confrontation with Satan himself before he even started his ministry. Okay? A lot of people say, well, you know, the devil got me bound. No, you ain't dealt with the devil. You've been dealt with some demons. You ain't dealt with the devil himself, okay? But we have to start looking at this so that we can recognize when we deal with people, when we deal with people in certain situations to understand what the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers that give different levels. So we're going to have to understand, and in order to do this, we have to look and see what the Bible says. You know, there are people that, you know, want to praise God, and for some reason or another, they can't get that praise out, okay? It is something that is holding you back. Now, do I believe that a Christian can be possessed? No, I don't. But I do believe that a Christian can be influenced. Amen? Amen. Okay? Because light and dark cannot live in the same space. That's my belief, and I haven't seen anywhere in the Bible where it teaches me different. Now, there are
there's people that believe differently, that's on them. I'm just telling you what I've learned. I don't know what God will show me in the next year or two years. I may say that they could be. But at this point, I don't believe that. But I believe that the devil can convince a person that they are being inwardly held, but they're not. Okay? The only place that the devil has any action to fight you, okay, is in your mind. That's the only ground that he can fight on is in your mind. The next one is in your emotions. Okay? That's why people, you know, they, when you hear people say, I'm just emotional. Well, you need to pray about that because you know what? You need to be spiritual, not emotional. Okay? Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 1, it says, blessed. Say that with me. Blessed. blessed. Say it again. Blessed. blessed. And the word blessed simply means fully satisfied. Blessed is the man or the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. What is that saying? That you do not get your counsel from ungodly people. Okay? Too many of us are starting to get our advice from family, friends, you know, people on the job. These folks are ungodly people. You need to get godly counsel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it'll do you more damage, more damage getting ungodly counsel I understand that there's people that mean well, they want to give you this type of advice, but if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it is advice you need to reject, okay? Blessed is the man or the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, nor stands in the path of sinners. What does that mean? That you're going to have to make a determination to separate yourself from people that you know are sinners. Now, what do I mean by that? People that you know who habitually do things against God. Now, there's Christians sitting in here. You've sinned against God probably just this morning. Okay, but God says, you know what? If you come, you can get forgiveness. But we're talking about people that, that have a way of doing it repeatedly over and over and over again. It says to not stand in the path of sinners nor seat in the seat of the scornful. What is the scornful? Those are people that make fun of what you are doing, serving God. You have to separate yourself from people. If, if you are intending, hear me, if you are intending to advance in the things of God, you're going to have to have full determination that you're going to go with God. You know, I like the way the man of God says it over in the book of Joshua. You know, for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And then he basically was saying, you do whatever you want to do, but this is what I'm going to do. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter who is going contrary to the word of God. It does not matter. What matters is the Bible says each one of you listening to me now, whether it be in this building or whether it be over uh, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever, each of us have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So that means you're not going to stand before God and say because of this person or that person, this is why you didn't do it. God, God is holding you accountable. He's holding you accountable for your own salvation. So you can love Betty Boo as much as you want to, but when you get to heaven, you understand me, God going to tell you it ain't happening. All right? Or you can love Bobby Joe just as much as you want to. But when it gets time for you to give an accountability, you will not be able to use that person as justification for what you did not do. Do you understand what I'm saying? But his delight, say delight. delight. But his delight, say delight. delight. But his delight is in the law. Now, when we see this word law, we automatically, our minds automatically go law. You know, a lot of us have lived lawless lives, all right? But all it's simply saying is his delight is in the word of the Lord. You delight in the word of the Lord, okay? That means that you get into the word of the Lord. Well, Pastor, I can't read. Praise God for audible. You don't have to read. You just need to listen, all right? See, you live in a day and age now that there's no excuse for you not being able to listen. You drive to work, right? Most of you, okay? Well then, put on 
uh, 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 the Bible while you ride to work. All right? There's no excuse anymore, people. We are under attack. Do you not understand that? Whether you want to accept it or not, the devil is trying to attack your health. He's trying to attack your children. He's trying to attack your grandchildren. He's trying to attack your, your mental status. He's trying to attack whatever he can. Today, you're going to have to make a decision that you're going to put yourself with God to be in a place where you have divine protection. Do you understand what I'm saying? It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates in it day and night. That means think on a scripture. Put a scripture in your heart and think on it. You remember how when we was coming up unsaved and we get one of them records? And, man, we didn't know the whole thing, but we knew the part we liked. Oh, that was the one we knew. We could sing that little old minute and a half and had it. Get, you know, come on, let's be real. Didn't know the rest of it, but I knew that part. All right? Get that part that you know in your heart of the word of God. That's what's important. Okay, that's what's important. You have to ask yourself, are you tired of living in a failure, in a fa position of failure? If you're comfortable in that, well, praise God. What I'm saying doesn't mean anything to you. You just keep on doing that. But there are some people that may be listening to me to say that, you know what? I'm tired of living in that place. I'm tired of living in that place of argument. I'm tired of living in that place of strife. I'm tired of living in that place of lack. I'm tired of living in that place of confusion. I'm tired of living there. I am tired. And today you must make up your mind that if you're tired, do something about it. See, I didn't like certain vegetables my mama gave me when I was a kid. She made me eat that stuff. You know? But when I got old enough where I could get away from it, and I, 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 I did. Well, you're old enough now to get away from some things. Stop letting the things of the past just keep knocking you upside your head. He said, but his, the law is in the, in the what? Word of the Lord. Now, now, if your delight is in the word of the Lord and you meditate in it day and night, this is the part I wanted to get you to. This is a promise. You shall be like a tree. Plant it. Plant it by the rivers of water. What is that saying? A tree is a strong thing. But notice it's planted by the rivers of water to continue to give it fresh nourishment, fresh nourishment, to grow, all right? That, that whenever, whatever it needs, it will never lack anything. It says to plant it by the rivers of water, and it says that brings forth its fruit. You have fruit that needs to be brought forth in its season. Because you're not experiencing your fruit right now, that's just simply saying that it's not your season. Don't give up. Don't give up. Your season is coming. Your season is coming because everything that God has done from the very beginning to this day is based off of seed, time, and harvest. Everything. That is a law of, that is a principle. That is a principle. He even said in Genesis, he said that the seed, that the fruit contains the seed inside of itself. God has made where everything reproducts after, re, reproducts after its own kind. Women, when a seed is placed in you, you produce a child. Men, when a seed or a vision is produced in you, you're supposed to be producing something from that. Everything God has created, he has created to be productive. Okay? What I am trying to tell you is a law and a principle. Okay, a law and a principle. There's no different. Okay, he says she'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf shall not wither. What is that saying? That whatever you're doing, it will not wither. Why? It's because you're that tree that's planted by the rivers of water where God is giving you divine protection. Okay? And whatever, say whatever. whatever. Now, I know I ain't the smartest person in this room. But I do not know that whatever means whatever. That's how I've used it all my life, whatever. You know how y'all say when somebody say something going on, whatever, all right? Okay, whatever. He says, whatever you do, whatever you do. Thank you, Lord. Whatever you do, whatever you do, she'll prosper. That 
That is a promise from the creator of heaven and earth. That is a promise from the creator that has created everything. Mm -hmm. I want you to start seeing this word of God differently. That when it speaks to you, it is alive. It is alive. This is just not a book we hold in our hand. This is God. This is God. Everything you want to know about him is held here in these words. That's why he says you must meditate day and night. Okay? The same thing that you read that I just gave you right here, the same exact thing that I gave you, is what was also given to Joshua in Joshua 1 and 8. It says meditate day and night. That wherever you go, whatever you do, you will prosper and be successful. I don't need a show of hands. Don't want a show of hands. This thing is between you and God. You see, the thing about this that I learned is God holds us individually responsible for our own decisions. My decision will never affect you, okay? And your decision will never affect me. But the thing of it is you have to come to a place either decide to serve God or to serve the devil. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. You can't sit on the sidelines of this fight. So if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're determined to be successful in the things of God, you must start getting hooked up regularly with your God. You must. You must. You must be, and I'll say this for those that are watching over Facebook. It's time for you to find a good church, a church that you can learn the word, a church where you can grow. Not one that your great grandmama, your grandmama, and your mama belong to. You ain't learning nothing. You understand? You see, you got to be in a place where you can be fed and developed. That was the difference with the 12 men that stayed with Jesus versus those that were at the synagogue. The ones with Jesus were being prepped for something. The ones that were in the synagogue, they thought they had something. So the thing of it is, is today make that decision. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you, but I'm making the decision. I don't know about you, but I'm making the decision. And then you look, the other neighbor look back and say, well, I don't know. I'm going to keep you in prayer just in case. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I just wanted to share that with you. We're about to have a dynamic time. God has a powerful word for us. And I've been waiting, you know, all week in expectation for this word. Because the woman of, woman of God that we're about to bring up is a very anointed woman of God. And God, you know, and, and you know, when I say a woman that has her ear to God's lips, that's what she is. She doesn't talk that much. She smiles. But you can believe that when God is stirring something in her, she is bold enough to speak the truth. And that's what we need today, a person that is bold enough to speak the truth. Sometimes you know what the word, the Bible teaches us, that the word is for correction and rebuke. Yeah. All right? It's not always the filly, filly, good, good filly, you know? Sometimes mama used to give me cookies, and sometimes she used to give me the belt. You understand <laughs> me? And to her, both of them say, or both of them serve the same purpose. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you. Amen. So without further ado, I bring Evangelist Cindy to you, and let's extend our hands to the, toward the woman of God. Father, we thank and we praise you for the word that you've embedded in her. We thank you, Lord God, that she has free course, Lord God, that she has free course, Lord God, that you will use her tongue, but you have given her the tongue of the learned. So I thank you, Lord God, that you and you alone, Lord God, will speak to us, Lord. We thank you for that full empowerment that you have placed on her by and through your anointing. Father, we seek you, Father through the words that we receive today. And we take authority over the devil that he has no action for disruption or disturbment in any way, form, or fashion. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And let's give the Lord a shout. Amen. 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 Children, children, for the children's ministry, you are dismissed. All right. I'm going to give you a right hand praise. Amen. Bless God. Bless God.
better. I thank God for Pastor Mel because uh, that was a good word, a powerful word, and it aligns itself up with what the Lord has given me for today, and I thank God for that because I didn't talk to him, contrary to what people would probably think we had a conversation, but we did not. Put it there. Will you still be able to hear me if I put it there? Is that good? All right. I could talk loud if I need to. Bless God. But I just praise God for that because while he was talking, I was thinking about on Friday, I had to um, deliver a word on Friday. And after I delivered that word on Friday, about two hours later, the devil just attacked my body. Thank you. And so the enemy is real. He is not trying to allow you to go forth in an easy way. And when you do, he's going to make sure that you know about it. Yeah, I heard what you said. Now let's see what you do with this. So it was hard for me that day, and I almost called 911. That's how bad it was on Friday night. But I said, you are lie today. I'm not calling nobody. I'm going to sit right here, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe God is going to come, and he's going to heal me. And he did just that. Now, I'm not 100% on today, but that's all right. I know that I'm already healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What the devil meant for bad, God will turn that thing around for good and he knew that today's word was going to be powerful so he thought he was going to shut me down I was like it's not happening it's not happening and we have to do that we have to let him know that you are not in control you do not have authority over me you will not take this word from the people of God that he has for them today I know as well as you know that it's going to happen he's going to come through he's going to do whatever he needs to do to discourage us but we have to stand fast we have to stand firm because we have more power than he does. Right. Speak the word. Amen. Right. Speak the word. So I just thank God on today. I just, um, I'm on full. 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 So we're going to try to get through this. Amen. amen. We're going to try to get through this. And I just ask the Lord that he would just saturate the atmosphere because it's in the atmosphere that things begin to change. When we begin to praise God in the atmosphere, blessings come down, and it manifests itself in our lives. So we have to be sure that we give God the praise. Psalm 47 and 1 says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. <laughs> Hallelujah. Clap in your hands. Set the atmosphere. It sends God into the atmosphere. He comes down when we let him know, God, come and see about us on today. Come and see about us on today. So I thank God for that because he will dwell in our presence. Pastor Mel had already told us that God inhabits the praises of his people. He will do that. The more you praise him, the more he comes in. And he wants to see him. He wants to come in. And he wants to dwell with us. We just have to give him that space to be able to do that. So when you begin to feel his presence, when, you, when you're praising him, when you're praising him, it's a sweet place. I don't know about for you, but for me, it's a sweet place. And then, after he has come in, hallelujah, is that me? And then when he comes in, it's a sweet peace that comes with that. It's a sweet peace that comes with that. And so he said in Psalm 16 and 11 that the, um, there is uh, joy in his presence, fullness of joy in his presence. And so we want to make sure that we have God in our presence. Amen. Amen. We bless your name, Lord, because you are so worthy to be praised. So let's go to the word. I'm going to be coming from Matthew 8. I'll be reading from the King James Version, because I'm a King James kind of girl. That's just the way I was raised. Didn't have anything to do with um, any particular version that I loved or whatever. That's just what we grew up on. And so that's really all I know. I do go to other versions to, you know, see what they have to say about it. For the most part, though, I'm a King James girl. Are we there? Matthew chapter 8. Starting at verse 5, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, 
there came unto him a centurion beseeching or pleading him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should have come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say unto this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another cometh, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to them that follow, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And jumping down to verse 13, it says, And Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of his word. I absolutely love this passage of scripture, and it's been in my spirit for a couple of years, Matthew 8 and 8. But now today I get to talk about it, amen, and I'm so excited about that. So our topic is taken from verse 8, and we're going to reread that. It says, The centurion asked and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Our topic for today, and it just goes in line with what Pastor was talking about earlier, and it lines itself up, speak the word only, amen? amen. Speak the word only. Speak the word only. A little bit of background, we are in one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a part of the synoptic gospels, and all that means is that they're writings of the same stories with similar sequence. And sometimes they have identical wording. But the difference is that they have all different perspectives. Because they all, we can see the same thing and I can tell it differently than you see it. You might see a little something I didn't see. We see the same thing, but we all have a little bit of a different perspective on it. Amen? Amen. So what I love about Matthew is that he stays true to his heritage. He was a Jew who is writing to the Jews about a Jew. Y'all got that? He is a Jew writing to the Jews about a Jew. So he writes to his people about the long-awaited Messiah, the king of the Jews. And I love how he presents Jesus in this passage for who he is. He tells us about his miracles, and he shows Jesus as the authority over every realm. And Pastor just talked about that, and I praise God for that. Jesus has authority over disease. He has authority over demons. He has authority over death, and he has authority over nature. Amen. Amen. Jesus has a power over all things. Amen. And so this book is divided into seven sections. And right now we're in the power section. Amen. Right. We're in the power section. All so right. Matthew is revealing the power of Jesus and his works in this passage. So our story begins with Jesus entering to the city of Capernaum. This centurion, this Roman army officer, this Gentile, because we need to set him up about who he is, right? He's a Gentile who apparently has heard about Jesus and his miracles and his healing powers through the Jewish people, or perhaps even his servants, which I'm sure they were Jewish as well. And so in chapter uh, 7 of Luke, Luke gives his, his perspective. Okay. He gives us his perspective by saying that the, the centurion had a good relationship with the local Jewish people and that he had done some good works for them. So when you get a chance, go over to Luke 7 and read what Luke has to say about this same story, what he saw. Now Luke says that this centurion loved the Jewish nation and had built them a synagogue. So it's safe to say that he had heard from some of those Jewish people about Jesus and who he was and what he could do. Amen. So this Nigeria says to Jesus, Lord, my servant is at home. He's sick of the palsy. He's grievously tormented. And according to Roman laws in that day, he had the right to have his servant healed if he was gravely ill or if he was injured 
and he could no longer work or he could be of service of him. They could do that. That was a law, the Roman law. They could kill him for being ill. And so I remember, we have to remember that the Romans were oppressing the Jews at that time also. So this Roman came to hear about Jesus. And he knew that Jesus could help him. He knew this. And I had heard of, um, a school of thought that says um, we are only three or four people away from somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that we need to know, <laughs> amen, amen, that can bless us. So I believe that the, the centurion uh, had that kind of hookup with the Jews. And you can read about that in Luke. It kind of talks to that, speaks to that in Luke 7. So nonetheless, he got to Jesus. and he, But I thought about, look at the love that he had for his servant. You know, when he could have had him killed for being so sick. He said he was sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. He could have just had him, he, he could have just had him killed and just been a, done away with that. But he didn't. But look at the love he had. Look at the heart of compassion that he had. Look at the humility of this uh, Roman officer that he had for his servant. So after he asking, after asking Jesus to come and heal his servant, Jesus immediately said, I'll come and I'll heal him. And I'm sure that um, he knew that uh, it was against G Jewish custom. Let me get this right. It was against Jewish custom for any Jew to enter into a Gentile's house. So I'm looking at Jesus, and I know he's going against the traditions of men because that's what Jesus does. Isn't that not what he did? He went against the, tradition, the traditions of men. And, of course, also he did it for the benefit of them that were standing around in the crowd because he knew they were listening. He knew they were watching because he had already turned to tell them about this man's faith. So we knew there were people there, amen, watching and listening to see what he was going to do, all of them knowing the laws and the customs of the land. And so... They wanted to see how Jesus was going to respond. And he did just exactly what we thought he would do. Without hesitation, he said, no problem, let's go. I'll do it. Let's do this. And I'm sure at that moment, the centurion remembered that the Jews believed that the Gentiles' homes were not worthy of them to be in. And so I'm, he probably thought, oh, God, I said that too fast. Jesus, come to my house. But I know that... I'm not worthy of him because he said that I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. And so he probably thought Jesus has all this fame. There's no way he'll come to my house. But he probably didn't think that through about how he was going to get his sick servant to Jesus or vice versa. Amen. But Jesus didn't have a problem with that. He said, I'll go. Just let me go. So he says, but if you would just speak the word only, just send a word to my house and my servant will be healed. He believed Jesus had true authority, true power, and that he command things to be done just by speaking a word. He also understood authority because he said, um, as the Roman law as pertained to him and the Jewish people, he understood the consequences of what could happen if Jesus came to his home. But in verse 9 he says, uh, it tells us how much he understood authority. He explains himself to Jesus. He said, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. I understand how things work. He said, because I have soldiers under me. If I say to this man, go, he goeth. And to another, come, he cometh. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. And Jesus listened to him at that moment at what he had said. And he was marveled by what he said. And he was amazed by what he said and what he had heard. And he turned to the crowd and he tells them, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus told him right then, just go your way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. So the confidence that this man had to believe in Jesus' authority, both naturally and spiritually, was amazing to me. And he truly believed that Jesus only needed to send a word. A word. He didn't even have to go there. He just had to send the word to the house. Amen. And his servant would be healed. That shows great faith. Great faith. And so this is exactly what the Lord wants from us. To have great faith. Great faith in his word. Faith to believe that you only have to speak a word. It can change situations. 
It can change circumstances. It can change outcomes of all things. Speak a word. So great faith will cause you to believe and will cause you to have authority to go out and speak a thing into existence. I'm sure some of you have done that before. Have you not? Speak a word. Take authority over things. We have to do that. Pastor Mel just talked about that. He just talked about that. The word is important. We have to learn how to speak a word. And we have to learn that we can send a word out to accomplish where it has been sent. And you can read that in Isaiah 55 because it says the word will not come back void. You send that word out, it's not coming back to you. And it's not going out void. It's going to go out. It's going to accomplish that which it is set out to do. That's a promise from the Lord, Isaiah 55. Read it in your leisure. So it would stand to reason that I could speak a word to my family about healing in Kentucky or West Virginia or Ohio from California and believe (laughs) that the word is going to go forth and accomplish that which I sent it to do. And then I'm going to wait to hear the testimony about what the Lord did and how the Lord healed. Girl, thank you. We, I, know you I know you were praying for me. I know you were praying for me because the Lord healed me. No different from what I did on, on, on Saturday morning, Thursday night, Friday, I'm sorry, Friday night, Saturday morning. I'm like, I'm going to need some prayer because the enemy is attacking my body. Don't nobody want to go to the ER. I know I don't. I don't want to sit in the ER for hours waiting for somebody to come. I could die sitting in a chair. But I know how to pray. And I know how to call people who know how to get a prayer through. Pray for me. Touch my body, God. I was touching my, uh, anointing me from the head to my toe. God, I'm going to need you to fix this. I'm going to need you to heal this. Because I got to speak on Sunday. And I'm not going in there talking about I can't speak because I'm not healed. Not going to happen. Devil, you a lie. Not in my life today. It's not happening. It's not happening. So we have to learn how to speak a word. And yes, it's for all of us, not just for those of us who stand behind the pulpit. Come on now, let's be real about it. You a believer? You a believer? Then you have the authority, the power to speak a word to your life. It says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 13, we having the same spirit of faith. According to as it is written, I believe and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus. We've been given that same authority through Christ to do the same. Speak a word, send a word. Amen. Amen. How will we ever know what the word will accomplish for us if we never speak it? We could talk about it all day long. But if you're not speaking a word, how do you know what it's going to do? How do you know how much power and authority you have if you don't ever speak it? We've got to speak the word. It's just that important. Mark 11 and 23, one of my favorites. It says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and thou can cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall, not maybe, but shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. That's powerful right there. That's powerful right there. You can speak to that mountain, amen, and it will do what you say. God is looking for some great faith folk. That's what he's looking for. In order to see the limitlessness of God, That means the vastness of God. There is no ending to what God can do. We have to believe it, and then we got to speak it. Bottom line. Amen? Amen. But now, in order for this to come to fruition, because there's a a but, but, or if, we don't know the word, how are you going to speak a word? If the word is powerful, I'm not talking about what you know. I'm talking about what the word says. What the word says. We can't go around talking about what we say. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 tells us what? Study to show thyself approved unto God, all right? A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's important that we know scriptures for ourselves. 
you can't speak nothing and have it be powerful if it's not scripturally based. Amen. Amen. So we should be able to do these things in word only, in word only, and as it pertains to the things of God, it's got to be of sound doctrine according to the word of God. This is where our authority comes from. This is where our power comes from. Amen. Amen. Job 22 and 28, and I'll be giving you scriptures so you can write them down to read them later. If you decree it, God will establish it. These are promises in the Bible that we have to know. He can't do it if you don't speak it. So declare it and decree it and declare it. And I heard a preacher say once, and I love this, it says, if you're not saying it, then you're not seeing it. And if you're not seeing it, it's because you're not saying it. That's powerful. That's a truth that we can hold on to. Amen. That's why we have to speak the word only. Because the word is what? Powerful. Amen. It's powerful. And so those of us that have been given a word to be able to speak that word or when prompted by the Lord to speak a word. As believers, we should be able to give someone an answer for the hope that is in us. Amen. Amen. We must use the power of the word to give strength or comfort or hope to them that need it. We should be able to speak a word in every season, as Pastor was saying of life, that someone may be going through a kind word, a gentle word, a comforting word, a word of wisdom, a word that could provoke change, amen, and energize hearts. We can speak a word that has the power to restore, power to rejuvenate, power to renew, power to revitalize life, as well as healing and deliverance and those who need to be set free. The word covers it all. The word covers it all. And the pastor said that earlier. You can find whatever you need in the word of God. I don't care what you're going through. The word covers it all. One word can change a situation. One word can turn something around. One word can move mountains. And one word can make the difference. We have to believe that. So you ask yourself today, because it's personal. I heard him say that too. It's personal. Do you have that kind of faith? The kind of mustard seed faith. And I don't know if any of you know anything about a mustard seed. I have one at home. I didn't bring it. But it's about that small. You can even see it probably if I was holding it up here. It's that small. Mustard seed. If we have a mustard seed of faith, that's all he said. We need it. That's a little bit. Ain't that just a little bit? That's a little bit. That ain't even a lot of faith. That's just a little bit of faith. He said, we have that kind of mustard seed faith. Think about what you could speak. Think about what you could have. If you have that little bit of faith. I ain't talking about faith that's the size of a mountain because God does not care about the size of our mountain. He cares about the size of our faith. That's what he cares about. A mustard seed is so small. That's a little bit. He, he, he just had that much. Just that much. Amen. That's all we need to move the mountains in our life. Listen. Get this down in your, in your spirit. And you can write this down. My mountain knows my voice. My mountain knows my voice. Say it again. My, my mountain, mountain knows my voice. voice. Yes, and I would say that you say that as many times as you need to so that it resonates down in your spirit until it becomes so powerful that you know that I got enough faith to say my mountain knows my, my voice. It knows my voice. So I can speak to it, and it will. Woo, thank you, Jesus. So we're going to speak to our mountains on today, amen, yeah. after this. And it's during those times that I remember that I have to go to the Lord and just tell him, I'm about to speak a word. Do you hear me speaking a word, Lord? I'm speaking a Lord. I'm speaking a word. I'm speaking a word. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we're all living in a time when people are searching for truth. And we all have mountains and we all have obstacles and we all have hindrances in our lives. As believers, we are carrying this truth. We're carrying this truth. This word that God has entrusted us to speak to people who need this. Truth that we can, people can, that they can stand on. I'm sorry. Get, um, truth that they can stand on. Amen? Amen? He's entrusted us with that word so that we can speak those words to those who need it. And cert 
certainly again not speaking according to what we think and not our own opinions about what we think the word of God may say let's be clear about that because we can't just go forth and talk about what we think the word says we got to know what the word says because that's where the power comes from when we know what the word says amen? amen and the word is not up for any private interpretation and you can find that in second Peter 1 20 and 21 the word is not up for our own private interpretation don't try to interpret the word to whatever you think that it may mean second peter 1 20 and 21 speak the word only speak a word of truth as it speaks it will strengthen it will reinforce it will increase it will provide it will encourage and it will support it's vital that we bless others with the knowledge that establishes and understanding as a mean to living this life and walking in holiness giving others a word of life and hope even mercy and grace as well as comfort with knowledge comes understanding with understanding comes wisdom and with wisdom comes belief and with belief comes great faith and with great faith comes greater works amen, amen. Jesus said we were going to do greater works he said we would do greater works in John 14 and 10 through 12. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. The word and works are a powerful combination. The word and works, because faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible tells me, amen? amen. So the word and works are a powerful combination. The word always has the final authority. And the word of God is our number one weapon against the enemy. We, when we speak the living and breathing word of God, de demons tremble. Pastor talked about them demons, didn't he, this morning? Amen. They are real. Just so you know, whether you believe it or not, read uh, Ephesians chapter 6 in your leisure, and he'll tell you about him being the prince of this world. He has authority and dominion over this world right now. So he's real. He's real. But please let's not get that twisted. Amen? Amen. And these demons are not trying to hear the word of God being declared in power and authority. They tremble at the word of God. They have to flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. Those are some real things. Give him the word. Give him the word. They they don't like the word. They don't like the word. But we have to give it to them in power and in authority. You can't go up on the devil talking about, get away from me. I need you to leave me. Go away. I don't want to be bothered today. And would, would you leave? You better have some power and some authority in your mouth and speak it. Get out of my face today. We're not doing this today. Amen. you got to have power and authority with the word of God. Because it says, if I resist you, you have to flee. So you got to go today. we got to speak it with power and authority. Because that's the only way. And I think the pastor started talking about this a little bit. In Matthew chapter 4, it, it talks about Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Remember that story? And he was tempted by the devil. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and so he was weak and he was hungry, right? Because he, he was human at that point. And it said, The tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to turn into bread. But Jesus answered him and said, It is written. And we better tell the devil just that. It is written. And then give him the scripture. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And earlier I said that Jesus had all power, amen, and authority over every realm, diseases, demons, death, and, de and nature. So how awesome is it to understand and to know that we also have been given that same powerful authority, amen, to speak a word to each of those realms as well. We have the power to do that. So we have to begin to walk in that. We have to begin to live in that. We have to begin to breathe in that. We have to use the power of the word. John 15 and 7 says, If you abide in me, 
and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. Amen? So speak the word only. Speak a word to your circumstances. Speak a word to your situation. Find scriptures that support that. And then you can stand on those, and you can speak those. So you can speak a word for healing. With his stripes, we are healed. Amen? Isaiah 53 and 5. Heal me, O God, and I shall be healed. Jeremiah 17 and 14. Speak a word for deliverance. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Psalm 34. Speak a word for restoration, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Joel chapter 2. Amen. Speak a word of strength for the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. Speak a word when you're in doubt, even though we're not supposed to doubt. But sometimes, just be honest, you do doubt. I, my favorite scripture, and this is the one I use for when in doubt. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Psalms 138 and 8. I have lived on that scripture. I have lived on that scripture. I have lived on that scripture over the years because I'm telling you, Lord, I need you to perfect that which concerns me. There's so many things I need you to perfect that, Lord, which concerns me. Psalms 138 and 8. So we have to make it a lifestyle of speaking the word. It will change your life. It will change your perspective. Just ask the centurion. He'll tell you, right? He'll tell you his truth and that he would forever stand on what he said about God. Just speaking the word only. Just come, just speak the word only. My servant will be healed. Think about how his faith level soared on that day. Can you imagine? He knew, he believed, and he had faith to believe that God, that Jesus was going to do it. But then to actually get home and see that his servant had been healed completely, just from a word that Jesus sent from somewhere else. Imagine his faith level and how it just soared through the sky. So Romans 1 and 17 says that we go from faith to faith, from faith to faith. We have situations in our lives that will happen that will cause us to go from faith to faith. If you don't go through nothing, how are you going to speak about anything? How will your, how will your faith ever be increased? If you don't have anything that you go through. So we go from faith to faith. And when you get to that next faith level, it'll be something else. And then you go to the next faith where you'll stay there until you get it. And then you'll go to the next faith level. But it goes from faith to faith. And the more it goes from faith to faith, the stronger that we get. The more powerful that we get. The more that we understand what kind of authority that we have in Christ. He's given us everything that we need that pertains to life. There's nothing that God has not given us in his word. Nothing that God has not given us in his word that does not help get us to where we need to be. Amen? Amen. Nothing. So all I know is that the centurion saw that miracle, and he was just, you know, probably overjoyed. I, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I can imagine. If it was me, I would have had, uh, uh, I probably would have had a party. Let's, let's just party, you know, for the man being healed and me being in the position where I didn't have to kill him. And I thank God for that love and that compassion he had for that servant because he could have easily just had him killed, you know, and done away with a life, you know. But what if he not went to go see Jesus? He would have never experienced that. He would have never experienced that. And so I thank God for that. And so all because he asked, Jesus, speak a word only. And I and my question to you today is what will speak a word for you? What will speak a word on for you on today? Pastor Mel already uh, gave you some directives for today um, earlier when he was speaking about today being the day of your decision, about what you're going to do. Am I going to stand today? Am I going to go forth today and do what God has called me to do? Am I going to believe God at his word? Because we have to. We cannot go by whatever it is that we think and how do we feel. Emotions, like he said, if you, you can't be emotional. 
I remember the Lord telling me that, and I was just going over like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And he was like, it's not about your feelings, so get up. That's a harsh reality when you, you know, because, you know, as women, we can cry at the drop of a hat. And when we want to get our way, we can cry. Uh, we can fake cry. We can do that. But I, think I thought God was going to be able to do that. He was going to be able to be that for me, too, you know, that band where I could cry. And it's like, get up, because it ain't about your feelings. And I was like, oh, God, that's so harsh. But I needed that for him to, for me to know that it ain't about my emotions. It ain't about my feelings. It ain't about what I feel about this situation. It's about what am I going to get from this when I get up from here. How's my faith level going to be increased if I don't go through anything, if I'm not willing to go through anything? Amen. And the Lord was like, get up. Dry your eyes. Get up. It ain't about your feelings. That was hurtful. I'm like, Jesus. Okay, so now I can't even cry. So now if I'm going to the Lord and I got even a little bit of tears, I'm even scared to do that. I don't even want him to tell me it ain't about your feelings today. And get up. So I'm like, okay, let me just dry my eyes and get on up and do what I have to do because we have to go forth in the word of God. Speak the word of God and speak the word of God only. Amen. It's imperative that we speak the word of God only. It is all we have that pertains to life. Not only life for us, but when we have that word and we've got that word down in us, we can give that word out to somebody else. And that's exactly what it's about. We're here so that we can be able to draw others in to Christ. So when we get it, they can get it. Because if we ain't got it, we can't give it. Amen? We can't give it. So I thank God for that on today. And I just thank God for this time of fellowship and this opportunity to hear from God. Lord, I thank you for the word of God that you've blessed us on today. I thank you for the word that you've sent. I thank you for the word that you're speaking to our hearts. I thank you for opening up our ears and hear what the Spirit is saying on today. Amen. And we do want to be like Pastor said. We want to be like that tree that's planted by the water. Rooted deeply. Grounded by the water. And the water is what? The word of God. Amen. That's how we grow. That's how we get rooted. That's how we're able to go forth and do the things that God has called us to do. Is when we are rooted and grounded in him. Rooted and grounded in the word. So I thank God for that. Lord, Lord, help us to go outside of ourselves and outside of our familiar territory. Amen. And obtain that great faith that we need to be able to witness to those who need to hear this great gospel. Help us to tell of your goodness and of the grace that helps us to walk in the power and authority that you've given us. Amen? Amen. We want to be able to take authority and power over the enemy so that he does not hinder our work for the kingdom. Because that's what he does. To, that's what he comes to do. To hinder us from what God has called us to do. Making you sick so you couldn't come up here and preach.